if you want to just kind of snapshot it and open it up on your phone, you can do it later. Should take, I don't know, Marco, you did it like less than 10 minutes, I'm hoping. Um, there's a website, it's on the thing. Okay, so we're gonna get started. So the whole sort of goal orientation outline of this entire six month course is really based on this thing we call IAIM. So I want the first thing that for you guys to learn is the indication, right? When to use your POCUS exam. The next thing we work on is the acquisition. So a lot of the lecture content is going to be your indications, right? Figuring out when can I use it? How do I incorporate it into my physical exam, my monitoring of patient sort of treatment therapeutics. And then the hands-on stuff is gonna be a lot of your acquisition and part of its interpretation. And, and this is where your Q bank comes in place is understanding the interpretation part of it. And then this part, hopefully you guys um, don't need a whole lot on because once you understand the interpretation, you know the medicine, so it'll sort of fit very nicely into your management. So that's kind of the whole sort of overarching theme for the six months that you're here. This does not want to advance. There we go. Come on, you can do it. There we go. Um, for the scope of ultrasound, for those folks who are not familiar with it, it is ginormous. So we can do everything from skin and eyeballs to bones for fractures, joints, arthrocentesis, uh, hematoma blocks, for musculoskeletal, for uh, tendinopathies, for um, sino uh, tendinitis. You can do it for like tenosynovitis, you can do it for muscle tears, you can do it again for eyeballs, nerve blocks for pain control, you can look for increased intracranial pressure with it, obviously anything vascular, so heart, lungs, DVT, uh, arterial system, and then obviously everything GI as well, so we can ultrasound stomachs to assess NPO status, obviously gallbladders, pancreas, livers, small bowel obstructions, diverticulitis, colitis, intussusceptions, kidney stones, uh, urinary uh, retention. We can try to differentiate the source of acute renal failure. So there's a huge amount of scope that point of care ultrasound can kind of fall into. Uh, there's also obviously tons of procedural stuff for it. And then there's very protocol driven. If anyone has a question, feel free to just like shout it out. Uh, very protocol driven as well. So trauma, today we're going to learn the FAST exam. I'm going to do a little bit more of a sort of medical spin on the FAST. So it's going to not just be sort of the quick and dirty 30 second FAST exam. Um, we also do what's called the rush exam to kind of figure out what source of shock your patient's in. So is it obstructive, cardiogenic? distributive, et cetera. Um, there's algorithms you can do to try to figure out what their volume status is to figure out hyponatremic, uh, to figure out hyponatremia, and then same thing for AKI. So we do point of ultrasound. There's tons of ED literature showing that it increases patient safety, especially for procedures. Uh, it decreases time to proper diagnosis and therefore decreases the amount of incorrect thera therapeutics and treatments. It saves money because now you're minimizing your workup because it's more focused because you have a better thought of sort of what's going on. And it actually improves patient satisfaction because it makes them feel better. It puts you at the bedside for a longer period of time with the patient where you can actually really connect. You can do a little bit of teaching to the patient as well, and um, they really do love it. And you get a lot of information out of it. Physics, we're going to go through like uber fast because it's super boring. I'm only going to try to give you guys the important things. So when it comes to echogenicity on the ultrasound machine, it is essentially like 200 shades of gray. And so just know that anything is black is fluid filled because it does not absorb sound at all. Sound completely travels right through it. Anything that's uh, some version of gray has some absorption of the sound and some reflection of the sound. And then anything that is white is either completely bone, calcium, so like stones, or it's air, meaning there's no transmission of sound waves through it and everything gets bounced back. So hyperechoic, again, just bright white. And then this is actually a rib fracture. And here you can see there's another rib fracture. And one of the kind of tricks you can see with something that's hyperechoic, we'll get into it in a few minutes, 
but it actually causes the shadowing. So what's happening is these sound waves are hitting this bright structure, so the calcium bone, and nothing is getting transmitted through it. So everything bounces back to the probe. And so the machine can't see anything that's deep to that structure. And so to the machine, it is absence of information, which shows up as black. So you're gonna get the shadowing. So it's a nice clue when there's a stone, because then your eyes can track kind of deep to that bright white thing and say, is that a bone, is it a stone? And if they see shadowing, you say, oh, yep, it's a stone. So there's a stone in this gallbladder because there's bright white with a shadow. Here's another example of a stone, bright white with a shadow. Cool. <laughs> Rock on. This is totally stolen from Dr. Hazlitt. Um, hypoechoic just means that it is less bright than the liver. So we use the liver as sort of our organ to compare grays to. So you gray is the liver that's isoechoic. Anything lighter than the, the liver is going to be hypo, meaning a little less, obviously. Um, normal kidney should be less bright than the liver. If your kidney is brighter than the liver, then that can be either chronic kidney disease or it could be acute like uh, medical renal disease like interstitial nephritis, lupus nephritis, ATN. So that's going to kind of give you a clue. Um, same thing when we look at the fascia layers and the muscle and the soft tissue. There should be these nice differentiation between the layers of gray and black and white and darks. And when they all start to sort of merge together and look homogeneous, where we say loss of architecture, now you're looking at like a cellulitis. So again, these are going to kind of clue you in. More of the same. More of the same. Cool. Um, isochoic is essentially the liver. So anything that's the same texture, grayness of the liver is isochoic. And then the last one is anechoic, which is essentially anything fluid filled. The clue for fluid filled stuff is that anything that's gonna, all the sound waves that hit through this bladder, right, that's fluid filled is gonna be traveling faster and more sound waves are going to hit the back wall of that fluid filled structure compared to the sides where there's not traveling through fluid. So it's automatically brighter behind a structure that's fluid filled. And if you notice here, right, there's fluid in the intra-abdominal space, this free fluid, and you can notice it's bright white back here. So we call that posterior acoustic enhancement. But the really nice thing is you can use it to train your eyes to tell you that this is a fluid-filled structure because there is posterior acoustic enhancement. So we can do that when we're looking at the heart, trying to figure out if there's a pericardial effusion. If you're looking at an abscess, and you're not sure, is it the lymph node or is it an uh, abscess, right? If there's no posterior acoustic enhancement, it's probably not fluid filled and maybe it's more lymph node or something solid. And they do ultrasound fish too, which is kind of cool. Um, physics, the one thing just really to understand for the physics is that the distance it takes or the, the time that it takes for the ultrasound beam or the sound wave to make it back to the probe is how far down that structure is. So the machine says, oh, this structure right here took you know, a tenth of a second to get to me, whereas this structure down here took a full second. So this has to be deeper than this structure. So it's just understanding that whatever's to the top of the probe is more shallow, closest to the probe, and whatever's at the bottom of the screen or furthest is sort of deepest, furthest away from the probe. We did some of these artifact stuff already, so I can kind of skip through a lot of this. Um, attenuation is really just the way of saying that the sound beam loses strength as it gets further down, deeper in. Um, this is the posterior acoustic enhancement, right? So you just get more sound waves that are traveling deep to the fluid filled structure than alongside where it's sort of solid, because the solid area has attenuation, so it's going to slowly lose brightness, whereas the fluid filled structure does not have attenuation. And so you have continued brightness behind it because you have more sound waves. Shadowing, we sort of did already, right? It's the complete absence of knowledge what's going on behind it. It's like if you're in a black room and you have a flashlight and there's a pole in the middle of the room and your flashlight hits the pole, the pole will light up, but you're not gonna be able to see anything behind that pole. 
same thing here. And again, it's a nice clue that there's it's a stone or it's a bone that you're looking at. And then it's also a way to if there's air, you're also going to get this thing. We call it dirty shadowing where you get a gray shadow. So instead of black, which is usually bone or stone, if there's air, you're going to get gray shadows. The other one that's kind of tricky and can mimic a, um, shadowing is this thing called edge artifact. And it's you can almost think of it like when you're driving in a car, it's that blind spot in your mirror. So what happens is these sound waves come down and they hit this curve of this fluid filled like periphery. And the densities are different between here and here. And so it makes the sound waves kind of jump off access and they never make it back to the to the probe, right? So only the sound waves that make it back to the probe is what makes your image. And so what happens is this little strip here, none of these beams that hit this area made it back to the probe. And so the probe just thinks that there's nothing. They think it's like a, a void. And so you get a shadowing on it. So we call this an edge artifact. This you'll see in any time there's a fluid filled structure next to something solid. So a common place you'll see this is in the gallbladder, and it's going to trick you up for a stone. One of the clues is that as you fan through or you slide through that gallbladder, that edge artifact never goes away. It always stays at the very edge of the of the gallbladder. And so it's going to make it look kind of weird that there's a stone that's tracking all the way through like that. So when you fan through or, or slide through and you see that shadowing in the same spot, that's going to clue you in that this is just an edge artifact. And it's one of those as the machines are getting better and better, some of these artifacts are actually getting more and more pro uh, prominent. The next one, and this is what makes A lines on your lung ultrasound, is called reverberation. So basically, the sound wave is just kind of bouncing back and forth, trapped in this sort of perpetual up down cycle. Sometimes they kind of get loose and they head back up. And again, the longer it takes for that sound wave to make it back to the probe, the deeper the machine thinks that structure is. So even though it's just seeing this reflection right here, because some of these sound waves are taking five seconds, some are taking 10, some are taking 15, the machine thinks that there's a line five seconds down, 10 seconds down, 15 seconds down. So it's causing this reverberation. So it's the same thing you see it kind of over and over again in parallel lines. This is normal for lung, we call these A lines. You can also see reverberation with like needle tip artifacts. So it's a nice way to know where your needle tip is, is by looking for that uh, artifact. Another one is called reverberation. So these are the artifacts that you get from like B lines or pulmonary edema, congestion within the lungs. And it's called also known as a ring down artifact. So it's essentially creating this vertical line extending from the pleura all the way down to the bottom of the screen. And it doesn't matter how, how deep you make your screen, they'll continue all the way down. There's a bunch of theories for it. I won't go into it. If you watch the core ultrasound videos, he kind of goes into it as something to do with the sound beams bouncing off the tetrahedrons in the lung. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of talked about reverberation. If you notice here, you see how there's these kind of comet tails? This is that dirty shadowing I talked about where you get that gray shadows from air. So this is emphygenous cholecystitis that you see here. So thickened wall, you can see some free fluid. There's some pericholecystic fluid. There's a stone because you can see some shadowing. And then here you can see these kind of comet tails of air trapped within that gallbladder wall. All right, the last one to just know about is this thing called mirroring. And it's essentially like, if you're staring at a window kind of at an angle, you know how sometimes you can see through it a little bit, but you can bounce back and you see your reflection as well. It's kind of the same thing. We see it primarily in uh, the diaphragm, so with on, on your FAST exam. Occasionally, you'll see it in the heart as well when you're doing echoes. And so what's happening is something that is a very strong reflector. So in like your fast, it's usually your diaphragm. And it makes the sound beam, it kind of comes down and it's gonna bounce off. And it hits some other structure that makes it bounce back to the diaphragm and then comes back up again. So the machine sees a delay 
in the return. So some sound beams from this thing, right, come down and just bounce right back up. But some of them come down and then go back and then come back up. So the machine sees that as a delay and it says, oh, there's something here, but there also must be something down here. And so you're going to see the same structure sort of reflected um, in front of and deep to that highly reflective structure. So here's like a hemangioma, and then you're going to see it again on the other side of the diaphragm. One of the clues you can look for is uh, we call the spine sign, and we'll go through this when we do our fast, is that if you don't see the spine extending above the diaphragm and you see something above the diaphragm, it's most likely a mirror artifact. Because if there was something bad in the lung, then the sound waves are now traveling through that solid lung, and I should be able to see what's ever deep to the lung, which would be the spine. And I'll give you guys examples. All right, almost done with physics. So transducers, just if you want to get really smart about it, you can know that linear is high frequency. High frequency gives you good resolution, but not a lot of depth. Phased array gives you depth, but not a lot of resolution. And then a curvilinear, I like to think, is the baby between these two. So the linear and the phased array got married and had a baby. And they give you the curvilinear, who gives you a little bit more resolution for um, more shallow things, but gives you much better depth. You can figure out which probe you're on based on the footprint. And when you look at the screen, so if it's a flat top to the screen, you'll see that you're, you know you're on the linear. So basically linear is going to be anything that's peripheral vascular. So like DVT is peripheral if you're doing arterial stuff, anything um, usually procedural. So central lines, if you're doing peripheral IVs, nerve blocks, that kind of stuff. Um, eyeballs and usually airways as well. Curvilinear is just like it says, so it has a curve to that footprint. Again, it's going to give you a wider footprint and it gives you a bit of a better shallow resolution, but also lets you see deep. And then this is your cardiac probe or your phased array. So this is the only probe that does echo. And be, the way it's designed is the crystals are sort of in an array. So they're stacked on top of each other instead of like in just a long line. So it's really great for motion. None of the other probes are gonna give you motion. And obviously for echoes, we care about the movement of the structures. And so that's why this one is your echo probe. It also has a very narrow footprint, which is nice to get in between the ribs. And then um, it's good for deeper structures. It's shallow field resolution, right? So really close to the top of the screen or the top of the probe is not as great. So I'm not a big fan of this one for when we do lung. I much prefer this one for lung, again, because you're going to be able to see two, three rib spaces. And this is a little bit crisper, so I can get a little bit better information about the pleural line. Um, the next thing on the probe and the screen are these probe and screen markers. So your screen marker just corresponds to the same side of the probe. So if you put gel and you kind of tap right here, it would light up on this side. It just lets you know that it's kind of the north of a map in the north of your probe. When it comes to orientation, um, transverse is sideways, longitudinal is probe marker up towards the head. Transverse, for us in the ED, we always do probe marker to the patient right. Unfortunately, you do need to learn um, planes again. So your uh, coronal plane is when the probe is on your side body. That's your kind of prototypical FAST exam and your kidney ultrasounds. When the probe marker is up towards the head and in the center of the body, so separating left from right, that's your sagittal. So those are like pelvic ultrasounds, bladder ultrasounds, like aortas and IVCs. And then the other one is your transverse. So your probe marker is to the right and you are separating the body from uh, top and bottom. So this is common for aorta, uh, gallbladders, we also do kidneys in the transverse plane as well. So when it comes to coronal, just know this corresponds to, and I have better pictures for the fast lecture. This up here corresponds to the patient's head. This is their feet, right? So here's the lung, there's their diaphragm, liver, kidney. And again, probe markers up towards the head. So lung is towards the head, kidney towards the feet. Sagittal. Again, probe marker is up towards the head. So head is up here, pubic symphysis, feet down here. 
And then for transverse, sorry, sagittal, probe marker again is up towards the head. And then again, head, feet, and then tubular structures, right, are going to show up as a tube. And then in short axis, they're going to show up as a circle. When it comes to scanning and movements of the probe, um, just so that we all have kind of similar terminology amongst us, hopefully we do, but there's sliding, fanning, twisting, and rocking. So sliding, kind of big gross movements up, down, you are trying to find the structure, or if you found it, you are trying to evaluate from start to stop. Fanning is you are essentially keeping the probe in the same location, but you are trying to image above and below. Just know that the more you fan, the um, less distinct and more blurred your images get. The more perpendicular you can stay, right, more sound beams are making its way back up to the probe. And so the image is going to be crisper and brighter. So fanning is great if you can't slide through something because ribs get in the way. But if you want the best images, it's going to be through sliding. Rotating is just trying to like bring something into its longest axis. So we do this a lot with the heart when you're trying to get a power sternal long or a power sternal short. Or if you are trying to like image a blood vessel in short and long access, we do a lot of rotating. And then the last one is rocking. And what rocking really does is it just kind of helps center the structure of interest. So say, and this isn't the best example, but say this like vessel I want kind of in the center, if I rock, it'll pull over. So rocking, I like to think is centering. All right, so quick on just some advanced features, M mode. So M mode is essentially a graph of motion over time. Anything that hits this line right here is going to be depicted as a up and down motion. So this is an echo for the heart. And then this right here is the mitral valve. So you can see the mitral valve opening. I should parse that over here. You can see the mitral valve opening. That's the early opening, your E wave. And then you have that atrial kick. So you have that second opening, which is your A wave. And then it closes for um, when the goes into systole. And then you go into diastole, and then the valve opens again. So anything touching this line is depicted as up-down motion. So this will come in handy when we're looking at valves, when you're looking for tamponade. The next one is just color. Just understand that red doesn't mean artery and blue does not mean vein. It's just telling you whether or not the ultrasounds, the flow is coming either towards the probe or away from the probe. And you can either remember like blue away, red towards like BART, or you can be like, I blew you away from me. But honestly, if you just look at the ultrasound screen, it has the scale on here. So red is going, is any flow going up towards the probe? and blue is any flow going away from the probe. So this vessel has flow going away from me, and this vessel has flow coming towards me. All right, the last like three things I'm gonna talk about is how to optimize your image. So the first thing, actually I'm gonna jump around a little bit. So the first thing, what when we start scanning and you're doing your independent scans, I really want you to hone in on image optimization. And the very first question, or the first thing to do is just drop your depth. Because nine times out of 10, the machine is sort of preset to something too shallow. And then you're kind of in the middle of the woods and you can't really see the forest and you don't really know where you are. So drop your depth down, kind of get your bearings, figure out where you are. So the first thing here, you can see the right, this image is not deep enough. This is a sub xiphoid view and part of the left ventricle is cut off and I don't see the entire left atrium. So depth is not proper. So bring your depth down. Once you get your depth, then you can kind of tweak your positioning. And then the next thing you want to adjust is your gain, right? So this, oops, sorry. This gain is really, really super dark. And so if you're under gained, you're gonna miss stuff. And I'm gonna tell you that there is a stone hiding in the gallbladder neck. And if the gain was more appropriate, you would have seen this very easily. Let's see if I can find the spot back and so we talked about shattering right so here's my gallbladder there's something bright white here and if your eyes track down you can see that there's a shadow right i can see something here there's black and then there's nothing here 
So this is really hard to find this gallstone in the neck. And so if you bring your gain up and make it a little bit brighter, it'll help that pop out a lot more. You don't want it so bright that like everything is gray and white, but definitely a little bit brighter than that. Cool. And then the last one is just sort of proper depth. If what I'm interested is like this thing right here, all of this information is wasted space. So once you zoom out, get your bearings, fix your probe positioning, adjust your gain, then you can zoom back in and get yourself that proper depth so that your item of interest is really kind of almost at the bottom of the screen. So kind of like right here. And then that'll bring this and it's like zooming in. It's like when you're doing a video and what you're trying to video is really far away, how you do your power zoom. And so you zoom in so that you can see it better. Um, the next one, really what you want to do, especially for lung ultrasound, is you want to try to get your probe as perpendicular as you can. Because especially for lung, if you're really fanned, this pleural line gets really kind of thick and shaggy. And it's hard to know, is this like sick lung, like pneumonia or ARDS or COVID, or is this pulmonary edema from CHF? And if you're really fanned through that lung, you're not going to be able to figure it out very well. So you want to get that, that pleura nice and crisp first. And here you can see, right, this is much crisper. Whereas this one, right, the pleura itself is really shaggy. So it's hard to know where these B lines are coming from. All right, cool. Any questions on? Steph, that last one you just said, I missed the plural crispness was the perpendicular. Is that what yeah. how you got it? Okay. Yep. Can you see my screen or did I lose it? I see it. I could I could see the image. I just wasn't remembering. Yep. I see it now. Stay yes. perpendicular. Okay. Exactly. Yep. So you just have to adjust your sort of left right fan when you're doing your lung to get that pleural line crisp. Perfect, thank you. Cool. All right, we are moving on and we're gonna do our eFAST. This is a bit of a longer lecture, so just bear with me. I gotta fix my, Teams hates me. Let me stop sharing. We will share again. Sorry, guys. Yes. Okay. We're going to need an IT person for <laughs> ultrasound. I know this. Is, oh, OK. Um, there you go. All right, that's fine. You guys can see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Bear with me because I don't see my like next slide coming up, so I might sound a little dumb. Uh, I have no financial stuff. So fast, right? Focused assessment, sonography, and trauma. So it's essentially a, a protocol that we used. It was originally developed for trauma, but I'm actually going to give you guys more of the medical workup for it, where you can apply a lot of what you find for the assessment of your medical patient. And then the E is just extended, and that's when we kind of extend up into the lungs. A lot of the FAST things that we're going to cover, we will cover again for echo, we will cover for lung, and we will cover for renal. So this is sort of a big, long lecture, but it's kind of an overview to kind of just help see a bit of the spectrum, what you're going to learn. So one of the things we use it in trauma, right, to try to figure out the shock. Is this a hemorrhagic shock and they're bleeding into their belly? That's kind of the trauma application of our FAST. But for us, we can also use it to help figure out their shortness of breath, right? We're looking up at the lungs. I'm looking for pleural effusions. I'm looking for pneumothorax. And I'm looking for uh, signs of pulmonary edema. I can also look at their kidneys and see, oh, they have bilateral hydro and an enlarged bladder. So maybe they have urinary retention and that's their source of renal failure. I can look to try to find if there's intraperitoneal fluid, if there's pleural fluid, if there's hydronephrosis, if there's something going on in the bladder like uh, clots or a bladder mass. 
I can look for a pericardial effusion. So is this syncope from tamponade or not? I can look for right heart strain as well. I can look for pulmonary edema. So there's a lot that you can do with your FAST exam beyond just your sort of straightforward trauma patient. Just know your FAST will start to become positive at 100 to 500 mLs, depending on your skill level. And then just know, um, sorry, the you get hypotensive once you lose about a liter and a half of blood, right? So once you lose about a third of your circulating blood volume is when you start to get hypotensive. So you will have a positive FAST before you are hypotensive. So that's kind of really important to understand because if you're hypotensive and your FAST is negative, the source is not in your belly. It could be retroperitoneal bleed. So if they're on heparin, they have spontaneous. Uh, it could be like a ruptured AAA into the retroperitoneal space, but it's not bleeding in their belly. Um, just know that things that are going to cause a positive FAST can be urine. So if they have an intraperitoneal bladder rupture, you're going to get it. Blood, obviously. Ascites. So if you have somebody with a super distended abdomen that doesn't have any history and you're trying to figure out is this ascites or like bowel obstruction, this is a really quick, easy test. And then bowel content. So perfed bowel is going to have a positive fast. Some pleural positives, very small amount of fluid in the thoracic space will give you a will give you a positive um, fluid above the diaphragm. Again, this could be lymph. So if someone's post cardiac surgery. Could be blood if it's trauma, uh, transudative, and then exudative as well. So the ultrasound is not going to really be able to figure out very well which one it is. Transudative is going to be more of a clear black, where exudative is going to have what we call plankton. So you'll see little kind of speckles in there. And then blood will have what um, we call the hematocrit sign, where the top layer is going to be black. But as the blood starts to settle, it's going to get brighter and brighter. So there's going to be sort of a black to bright gray sort of transition. For pericardial effusions, again, small amount is going to cause a positive. Blood can do it. Transudative, exudative, right? Malignancy, infection. There was a great case that um, we had where it was a patient who had strep pneumobacteremia who came in in tamponade from their exudative uh, pericardial effusion that was like strep. It was gross. And it was cool because we had a pre-ultrasound uh, when she first presented in the ED, got discharged, and then came back like three days later, and the repeat ultrasound showed the pericardial effusion. Um, just know, right, it can't determine your fluid type, and then it's very operator-dependent. So. Some people may see fluid, where somebody might not appreciate it. And then it doesn't show you your retroperitoneal space. Cool. So that's kind of the basics. How you do it is your curvilinear probe. Again, you can also use your phased array for your little nanas and your kids. These are our uh, five views. So we start, always usually start in the right upper quadrant. This is the easiest view to get. Gives you a lot of information because you can look at gallbladder, you can look at kidney, you got your liver, you got above the diaphragm, uh, you got your lung right here too. So typically right upper quadrant is your best view, kind of the good starting spot. Typically, it doesn't matter what order you go in, but you can do right upper quadrant, then left upper quadrant. Most people then jump to pelvis and then they'll do subcostal and then extend up into the lung. Again, doesn't matter what order you do it in, just kind of keep it in your mind. For a paddle renal, just understand that you're going to be probe marker up towards the head and you're going to twist your probe in the direction of the ribs to get in between those ribs. So probe marker is always going to head down a little bit towards the bed. Again, just slow sweeps, make sure your depth is appropriate. So we use our spine as sort of our proper depth marker. So if you find your spine, that one means your depth is good, and two, it means that your beam is aimed posterior enough that you're going to be able to appreciate free fluid that's dependent. And then rotate to get those rib shadows out of your way. For the questions we're trying to answer, you're looking, is there a pleural effusion? Is there free fluid in the belly? And I'm looking at the kidney, is there any hydronephrosis? And then anything else going on in the kidney. So those are usually the four things I'm looking at. Again, probe marker up towards the head, where mid uh, axillary line still on the rib cage. 
And so this is the view that you're getting, right? So this is our coronal view. Here's liver, here's kidney, and then diaphragm's up at the top. And then, right, spine is right here. So spine is the deepest structure. So if we rotate it, this is what you get. Five places we look for is above the diaphragm. So that's your pleural effusions or pneumonia. You're looking below the diaphragm. So in the liver side, if you have fluid between the diaphragm and the liver, it's more suggestive of like cirrhosis and more chronicity to it because normally the liver is very adherent to that diaphragm. And so if it's acute uh, blood, I wouldn't really expect it to be tracking up above the, the liver. Everyone knows to look between the liver and the kidney. This actually takes quite a bit of free fluid before it turns positive, and you'll see fluid here. So honestly, your best bet is this inferior tip of the liver. This is where you go from 100 ml positive to being able to pick that up versus looking at three, which is gonna be about a liter positive before this will turn positive here. And then also the inferior tip of the kidney. It's the same five places we look on the left as on the right. So again, above the diaphragm, below the diaphragm, between the liver and the kidney, inferior tip of the liver, inferior tip of the kidney. And then here, right, we've our depth is good. So we've got our spine. So I know I'm pointed posterior towards the beam is coming out towards the bottom of the bed. I know my depth is good because I can see my spine. And then again, I can see above and I can see below. Um, this it does have some rib shadow in the way. So we didn't twist enough, but that's okay. Um, what else was I gonna say? Oh, the other thing you notice, normal, right? You can see their spine, so rib, vertebrae, 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 right? And then it disappears. And we know your spine exists above your diaphragm. So this is telling me that the lung up here is normal and aerated, right? So there's no effusion, there's no pneumonia, there's no um, contusion down here because I do not see the spine above. So now all that sound wave is not transmitting through that aerated lung. So absence of spine tells me it's normal. And then not only do I look above, I also wanna look at the kidney too. So just kind of quick eyeball the kidney, make sure it's got a good outline, looking for cysts, looking for hydronephrosis. When we're looking for pleural effusions, just understand that if you are tipped to anterior, i.e. you're not finding your spine, right, you're going to miss fluid. Because if you are scanning from more anterior on the body, right, and you're looking up, you are your beam is cutting through the anterior portion and you're missing that dependent stuff. So when you're scanning, just make sure you're tipping posterior to find that, that free fluid. So here's a great example of your spine sign where you can see free fluid and the spine now all of a sudden continues up. So spine sign means pathology in the lung. The other thing to know is that free fluid is pointy. It's going to fill in nooks and crannies and crevices, whereas fluid that's contained within a vessel or like a gallbladder is going to be sort of more rounded. And that's kind of a, a nice way to appreciate the difference and help figure out if it's free fluid versus a gallbladder or an IBC that you're looking at. So here's another one. Again, we have our ribs in the way, but our depth is good. Here's my spine. So I have my proper depth marker. I'm looking above the diaphragm. And here I have a spine sign. So I know I have free fluid here. So there's a pleural effusion. Now I'm looking below, I don't see any fluid. I'm looking between the liver and the kidney. And now all of a sudden I see there's this black right here. And there's black kind of tricking up here too. So now I have something black that's pointy and filling in crevices. So not only does this person have a pleural effusion, but they also have free fluid in their belly. Could be ascites, it could be hemo, I don't know. Cool, same thing. Just like your lung, where you have to make sure your beam is aimed posterior, this is why I tell you to find your spine, is you want to make sure that your beam is posterior enough that you're going to be able to visualize that free fluid here. And if you see your spine, then I know I'm aimed posterior enough. If I don't see the spine and I don't see free fluid, I haven't really been able to rule it out. So same thing. So you can see as you fan anterior. And then this one, if you don't see your kidney, 
that's telling me that my beam is too anterior, right? Because if you notice when I was looking up, I wasn't visualizing my kidney. And once I bring the tail up and I fan down with that beam, I can now see my kidney. And now I know I'm posterior enough and that spine is now popped into my view. This one's a little bit tricky. There's free fluid here. If you look at that inferior tip, again, you don't see kidney, so they're not posterior enough and you don't see your spine. So I don't know if my depth is good. They just got lucky and happened to be positive. And then there's this, which when I first saw this view, I was like, oh my God, their liver's like shattered in half. But this is just a rib shadow. And if your eyes track up, you see it kind of comes from this little bright white and it tracks all the way deep. So, and if you watch the video, you can see that this shadow kind of track side to side as they breathe so not related to the the liver so just rip shadow but there's your free fluid and then sometimes it's really subtle this one's a little bit overgained but if you notice that that very inferior tip right there there's some free fluid and then right there you can see it too so this is positive even though it's little this was a ruptured ectopic. And then this one is obviously positive, but the other thing, right, if we look at the liver, it's definitely quite a bit brighter than the other livers that we saw. And if you notice, it's right, it's lumpy bumpy. So this is more cirrhosis. And then if you notice the kidney looks kind of funky too, how it's like bright white within that kidney. And so this is what we call nephrocalcinosis. So this person has a medullary sponge kidney. So it's common for that one. All right, cool. Other things we look for, right? Not only free fluid, but hydronephrosis. So here we're looking at the kidney and you can see that the pelvis of the kidney is distended. And we'll go through this quite a bit more when we do our renal lecture. But if we go back to kind of normal kidney, you can see how that's decompressed and it's white, right? So the pelvis is empty. There's nothing distending it. Once you get hydro, now that urine is backing up and it's distending the pelvis into the calyces, and this one is moderate hydro, where it's actually distending up into the pyramids as well. So if we look normal, decompressed, bright white, as the urine starts to back up, you're gonna to start to be able to see a bit more of the, the major pelvis. It'll track into the major calyces and up into the pyramids. And then as it starts to get to severe, you start to get this cortical thinning. So now the cortex of the kidney is thinned. All right, there's our hydro. And so some renal pathologies, you can see that there's something bright white in the kidney here, right? So this is your angiomyolipoma. This is just a benign, most common fatty tumor in the, in the kidney. Again, this is your medullary sponge kidney, it's just kind of bright white filled with calcium. This was a actual gentleman that came in in a car accident, was a trauma activation, got a fast exam and had this funky thing on his kidney. And if you notice, right, the there's some fluid in there and it's kind of distorting the architecture of the kidney. And so this was a renal cell carcinoma, which was incidentally found on his CAT scan for his trauma, which was undiagnosed. So sometimes you do your fast and you kind of find something which is kind of crazy, this cat, his car accident saved his life. Um, so take home point number one and two. Look for fluid where it doesn't belong, above the diaphragm, inferior tip of the liver, and then make sure you're looking at the kidney for any sort of pathology. Hydronephrosis, looking at the outline of the kidney for cysts and masses. Spleno renal view, we're gonna jump through real fast because it's exact same thing. Slow sweeps, make sure you adjust your depth, find your spine, twist your probe, get in between those rib shadows. You're looking for a pleural effusion. We're looking for free fluid in the belly. We're looking for hydronephrosis. And then we're looking for anything in the kidney. This one, you are actually a little bit higher up. So typically you want to start, um, I almost start kind of like near the armpit because if I start in the lung, the lung is very easy to identify because you're going to see ribs and you're going to see lung sliding and you'll see A-lines. 
if you start too low, you're going to end up in bowel. And bowel is just sort of bright white scattered everywhere. And you don't really know if I need to move up or down or left or right. So if I start too high, at least I know as I move down, something will start to come into my view. And then typically you want to be a bit lower because your kidney and spleen live more posterior. And so we always say knuckles to the bed. And if you notice how they're holding the probe, it's kind of like a um, pincer grasp between their thumb and forefinger. And that's going to give them the most amount of probe dexterity to be able to sort of fan through and do your twists and stuff. Same thing, coronal from our up towards the head. We're going to see our spleen, kidney, and then spine. We pull it over. Again, above diaphragm, below diaphragm. No, on this side, the first place free fluid is going to develop on the left is actually at the dome or the top of the spleen, and it's going to track along between the spleen and the diaphragm. So this one's a little bit as a little bit of a different spot where it develops. Again, between spleen and kidney, inferior tip of the spleen, inferior tip of the kidney. Pleural effusions, same thing. Find your spine, make sure you aim posterior enough. And then you can see. Here's diaphragm, there's spleen, right? We have our spine sign. This is just like add a lactatic lung or a little alien waving at you, whichever you'd like it to be. Or a little fat guy that's upside down and his legs are wiggling in the air. Planking. <laughs> <laughs> but if you also notice, they actually have some free fluid in their belly too. Because if you look right below their diaphragm, right there's some fluid tracking in between that spleen and the diaphragm. And again, free fluid, make sure you're tipping posterior to find your spine. To make sure that you're visualizing that whole space that's dependent. So again, we look above diaphragm, right? There's no spine sign, so there's nothing going on in the lung here. It's a little dark, sorry about that. Diaphragm's right there. I don't see any free fluid tracking on this sort of superior aspect or along that inferior tip of the spleen. Nothing in between spleen and kidney and then nothing at the inferior tip of the spleen. This one's a little tricky. So if you are very posterior, so your knuckles are all the way down to the bed and your beam is aimed upward, so it's coming out of the patient's like belly button towards the ceiling, you are going to catch a structure that gets bigger and smaller, depending on what time of the day it is, that lives anterior to your spleen. Do you know what that is? Stomach. Stomach. Yeah, totally. So this is a common fake out for people when they're doing their fast exam is they see something black and it's near the spleen. And so this is a stomach. And if you actually notice the little speckles within there, that's um, like carbonation. So this person's probably drinking soda. So it's a fun party trick. And then the other thing, if you notice, right, they also have a little bit of mirror artifact because you can kind of see something here and it looks like there's something over here too. But if you look at the spine, it just abruptly stops. Oops, what did I do? Sorry. Right, the spine just stops right there. So this has to be a mirror of what's in the stomach. And this is kind of what's going on. They're very posterior and they're aiming the beam coming up out of the this uh, going up towards the ceiling. And so here's spleen, and then deep to the spleen, they're seeing the stomach, and that's why it's showing up down here. Yeah. Same things. Hydronephrosis, again, here's some hydroureter. You can actually see there's a ruptured calyx because there's a little bit of free fluid around that kidney, and they have hydronephrosis with hydroureter. So this person had an obstructing stone. So again, just looking at renal pathology. Here's a big giant renal cyst. Again, with renal cysts, it's um, completely anechoic and it's got distinct borders. Zero percent of these are malignant. Very common over the age 50, about 50 percent of people will have it. So again, knowing where to look on the right upper quadrant, inferior tip of the liver and then above this diaphragm. On the left upper quadrant, we're looking at the dome of the liver and between liver and diaphragm. And then again, above the diaphragm. Pelvis is kind of a throwaway view, honestly. It's probably the worst out of all the views looking for free fluid. Your transverse, 
I honestly do to find where my bladder is. Mm -hmm. Because if people, they're a little twisted, maybe their bladders are kind of off center a bit. So if you start in long axis, it's going to be very hard to find it. So start short, find your bladder, and then sagittal is your money shot. That's where you really want to look. And again, we're looking for free fluid. Here we're looking, is the bladder super distended and they're having signs of retention? Is the prostate or uh, super big or is there... Um, like wall thickening of the bladder, which could suggest either mass, like um, urinary retention, like chronic urinary retention or a cystitis. And you can also use it to diagnose any Foley issues as well. So the bladder is normally tucked behind your pubic symphysis. So it is a pelvic organ. So it's really important that we don't try to find the bladder up by the belly button because that's not where it lives. So make sure that you are down by like the pubic hairline where the mons pubis is and your beam is starts at least aimed down towards the feet to find your bladder. Again, slow sweeps, make sure you have proper depth. And then once you find the bladder, you really want to then sort of sweep upward because that's where your free fluid is going to live. So this is normal. You can see bladder right here is prostate. And then, right, free fluid is going to live on the on the top of the bladder, which again, anything that's further away from the ultrasound probe, right? So further away is going to show up deeper. So for this one, when we're looking for free fluid, it's going to be deep to the bladder. So it's going to track kind of down here and above. So once we find our bladder, Again, in women, the most important thing, right, here's a uterus, is we get free fluid deep to the uterus too. So again, make sure your depth is deep enough that not only do you see bladder, but you also see deep to the uterus. And again, it's free fluid, so it's pointy, filling in little crevices, and both above and below the, the uterus. This is a much more obviously positive one. I really need to learn the name of the sign, but it's like the Star Wars Starship Destroyers <laughs> um, sign. I don't know what it's called, though. So once you find your bladder, then you're going to rotate your probe marker so it goes up towards the head. Try to keep that bladder in your view. And the important thing is you have to adjust your rock so that your beam is still aimed down into the pelvis. Because if you're looking up, into the, like towards the head, you're gonna miss the bladder because the bladder is living down here. So sweeps, make sure your depth is good. And then once you get your bladder, you wanna make sure that you kind of aim upward a little bit at least so that you can see this interface. Cause this is what I care about here. You're not gonna get free fluid on this side of the bladder. And I have a CT scan, right? So we're not gonna get free fluid down here this is where your free fluid is going to develop. So this is the interface that I really want to look at on my long axis. And then again, here's your free fluid. It's black, it's pointy, and it's filling in the spaces above the diaphragm. I mean, above the, the bladder. For women, just make sure that you're deep enough and that you're looking both between the bladder and the uterus. Women who get their period will normally have at least a third of the way up the uterus of free fluid, and that's sort of physiologic. More than a third is pathologic, or if you get free fluid between the bladder and the uterus, that's also pathologic. So for urinary retention, right, the first clue is going to be where you find the bladder. So if I put the probe on someone's belly and it's all the way up by their belly button and I have found their bladder, they are in retention. That is not normal, right? Or they have to go pee. And then you can check their bladder again after they pee. And if it's gone, then they just have a really large bladder volume that they can hold. Um, but normally it's pretty pathologic. You can also do a bladder volume. We'll do this when we do our renal, but you can measure the top bottom in the transverse view. So top to bottom and then side to side. You multiply those numbers by the long axis and you just take the longest dimension in the long axis and then the machine will spit out a number for you so you can determine their bladder volume. 
to look for bladder issues, right? You can also just assess if they have a giant prostate, right? This is a massive, massive prostate. You can just kind of eyeball it and say that is just not normal. Or you can find their bladder mass. So someone who's been having hematuria and say flank pain, and they're having some urinary retention, you can see that they have a big giant bladder mass. And then you can troubleshoot some Foley problems. So if their Foley is functioning, but there's no urine in their bag, right, you're gonna have a balloon with a decompressed bladder. If it's malfunctioning, you're gonna have a distended bladder and you can see the Foley catheter in there. And if it's malpositioned, you're going to have a distended bladder, switch that over, um, where you don't see the balloon of the Foley. So this one is in the prosthetic urethra. So you have to remove it or deflate the balloon and then try to advance it. Cool. So looking inferior tip of the liver, between the diaphragm and the spleen, looking deep to the uterus, and then top of the bladder for free fluid. We are in the home stretch, subxiphoid. So this is your cardiac view. So for this one, we're looking for a fast, it's your pericardial effusion, but you can also kind of determine what your EF is, look for any signs of right heart strain, and then rotate your probe 90 degrees and get a quick view of your IVC. We're gonna go through this really fast because a lot of this we're gonna cover in our echo lecture, which I highly recommend you can kind of come in person because it's a bit of a long lecture, um, but if you can't, I will record it. Um, so the big thing for this one is just know that your hand goes on top of the probe and your hand, the probe itself has to be pretty flat because you got to get that angle really shallow so that that, sorry, so that that beam can find the heart, which is sort of living right up here. If you wanted to learn nothing about echoes, just remember or sort of memorize that the right ventricle is always on the top of your screen. So whether it's parasternal long or subxiphoid, the right ventricle is on the top because your RV does this cool like kidney bean shape thing where it wraps around the left ventricle on, on the top side and bottom, just not posterior. So when we're looking for free fluid, it is going to track kind of dependently, so towards the bottom of the heart, obviously, and it's going to wrap towards the inferior portion. And that is going to be the closest part that's between the liver and the right ventricle because this is the bottom part of the heart that we're seeing right now. And so free fluid, if it's a pericardial effusion, is going to live between your pericardium, which is that bright white, and the myocardium, which is your muscle. So here you can see bright white of pericardium, and here is free fluid between the myocardium and the pericardium. And it is dependent because it is closest to the liver. If there's blood in there, this is not a happy heart, it's going to start getting sort of tissue dense as it starts to clot. So you can see these sort of different echogenicities within here. So there's some fresh blood and there's some clotted blood in there. This one's a little tricky. And so your eyes really just have to track, where's my pericardium, right? So here's the bright white of my pericardium and my myocardium is actually touching it. So where is this free fluid? Exactly, right? So this is intraperitoneal, right? So this is like uh, free fluid in the belly, not pericardial effusion. Does everyone understand that one? I'm going to say yes. For your EF, as really quick, we're going to go through this ad nauseum later. Um, good squeeze, we're looking at motion of the valve. How close does it get to the septum? How well does your lateral annulus go up and down? How good does the heart, does the chamber fill and empty? And then how much does the muscle thicken and thin out for systole and diastole? So that's a normal EF. You can see this is a much lower EF. So not great movement of that valve and much smaller change in systole and diastole of the chamber. When it comes looking for right heart enlargement, so like pulmonary hypertension or acute PE, we're looking at the size of the right ventricle to the left ventricle. So if you don't want to remember too much, just know that your left ventricle should always be bigger than your right ventricle. 
that's normal. Once your right ventricle gets bigger than your left, you're looking at some sort of right-sided pathology, whether it's PE, if they're coming in acute shortness of breath, or if it's um, like pulmonary hypertension. Some clues for pulmonary hypertension, if the RV wall looks really thickened and it kind of looks very trabeculated and muscular, kind of like the left ventricle, then it's a little more likely something chronic. Also, if the right atrium is really big, it's usually had some time to distend. And then you're gonna rotate 90 degrees and you're gonna look for your IVC. And so we're right in the center of the belly, we're in the sagittal view with the beam aimed a little bit towards the patient right side because IVC lives on the right. And you can see the IVC coming right into the right atrium that lives right here. You can see the ventricle, the tricuspid valve, and it's touching the liver. So again, if they're kissing and we look about a centimeter, two centimeters from this atrial cable junction. So our eyes are tracking right here. So if the walls are touching, their CVP or the filling pressure is very low, right? We're like three to five. If there's some respiratory variation, but less than, not more than 50% or less than 50%, their CVP is pretty normal. So, you know, five to eight. And if it's over two centimeters and there's no variation when they breathe, then their CVP is high. So it's usually uh, above 12. Cool. So look for fluid, take a look at the kidney, look for bladder pathology, and then you're gonna look at the heart for the function size, look for effusion, and look at the IVC. Final stretch, we're doing the lung. So for the lung, you're gonna be probe marker up towards the head, and then you're gonna slide down sort of the anterior lung fields on both sides. We've already done the base of the lung from our right upper quadrant and left upper quadrant views. So for lung, we're looking for lung sliding. So it suggests pneumothorax. Uh, it could suggest if they have like a super bad COPD or asthma exacerbation, you're gonna see decreased lung sliding. If they have pneumonia, you're gonna see decreased lung sliding because of the sticky lung. <laughs> if they've had a VATS procedure or if they have a bleb, you're not gonna have lung sliding. You're gonna look for lung pathology, so like COPD, sorry, um, look for pneumonia. You can also find uh, masses and tumors. Uh, there's studies showing that you can look for um, pulmonary infarcts as well. So again, probe marker up towards the head, and then we're sliding down the anterior chest wall. And what you're gonna find, right, there'll be a rib here and then a rib here. And in between those ribs, you wanna find that rib and the shadowing. And then the bright white that's deep to the rib shadow is gonna be your pleural line. So if you're not deep enough, people mess up and they mistake these fascial planes for the pleura. And then they're gonna call this a pneumo if you're, if you're not deep enough. So just make sure, again, always drop your depth down first and then you can narrow it down and sort of zoom in on what you need. And so essentially what's happening is the two visceral and parietal pleuras are sort of sliding back and forth every time you breathe. And it's creating this artifact of lung sliding where you're seeing these little comet tails and we call it ants marching. So this is nice and normal. Steph, real quick, yes. sorry, I put it in the chat, but I noticed oh, I that a, you're using the, um, the linear, like the different probe for the lungs. Are you switching out? Cause I know I've done curvilinear for the whole fast. Yep. Curvilinear is totally fine. You can do for lung, it's one of those fun ones where you can do linear, curvilinear, or phased array. Phased array, again, it's not that clear, crisp at the pleural line. If I only care about pneumothorax, I like to do the linear because I can see the lung sliding really well. But if I'm thinking more like pneumonia or CHF or pulmonary edema, then I prefer the curvilinear, or you can do the cardiac one too if you want to not switch probes if you're doing a dedicated echo. So again, okay, nice thanks. good lung side. Yeah, of course. If anyone else has questions, just unmute because I can't see the chat and I can't see anybody's face. So here we can notice, right? So there's my rib, here's my shadow. And then now all of a sudden I've lost that sort of sparkle glimmering sort of ants marching comet tails. So there's no lung sliding here. 
This could be pneumothorax, although it could be pneumonia. It could be asthma exacerbation, right? If you can't hear wheezes, you, you're not going to have lung sliding because you're not moving your air air. Um, this could be like a right main stem intubation. And so they're not ventilating the left lung. So there's a lot of other things besides pneumo that can cause this. What you need to find to say it is a pneumo is this thing called lung point. And what's happening is you're getting this interface. Oh, I guess I don't have it. Sorry. You're getting this interface where it goes from pneumothorax to aerated lung. So where it goes from space between the visceral and parietal pleura to where the two pleuras are now touching each other and they are now sliding. So here you see lung sliding and here you don't. So it's this sort of that point where you find that lung point is going to tell you how big the pneumo is. So if you find in the anterior, it's small. It's probably like an occult pneumo, only see on CAT scan, not so much on x-ray. If you find it under the armpit, it's about a 30% pneumo. And if you find it posteriorly, it's a very large pneumo. And if you can't find lung point at all, it is a huge pneumo, right? 100% collapse. Some lung pathology. Again, we'll go through more of this when we do our lung stuff. Uh, if you see the pleural line here, so here's a rib. And this is my pleural line. If you notice, right, it's shaggy and it's broken and it's interrupted. And there's B lines, right? So there's these reverberation ring down artifacts, sorry, ring down artifacts coming from the pleural line that's extending all the way down. So this is pneumonia. So broken, interrupted pleural line with focal B lines. Same thing here, lots of B lines. It's kind of a sticky lung, right? It's not having that greatest of sliding. And you can see that the pleural line is again kind of jaggedy, thick, and interrupted. Here, this is more pulmonary edema from probably cardiogenic sources. And if you notice here, the pleural line is quite a bit crisper and it's thinner. And you can see that these B lines is coming kind of from all over in different areas. It's kind of jumping back and forth as opposed to coming from one area. This is also pneumonia. So again, you can see, we call this the shred sign where you're getting sort of consolidation. This is a more severe pneumonia. Cool. So fluids, pathology, renal, bladder, looking at the heart, function size, looking at IBC, and then looking at the lung. Um, there's a QR code. To this, this is also loaded up in the Teams file under your FAST exam. So if you kind of want a quick reference, uh, we'll do just a super quick case in like the last 10 seconds. Um, so little Nana got admitted, uh, epigastric pain, dark stools, right? She's an obvious GI bleed. She gets her CAT scan, which showed duodenitis. She's in the belly in the hospital. She starts complaining of more pain. She's now getting more hypotensive and tachycardic. She's given two units of blood. They thought she's bleeding more. Doesn't seem to get any better. So now you do your ultrasound, right? Because we're trying to figure out what's going on because now she's becoming unstable. And one of the things we worry about when you have, you know, peptic ulcer disease, if it's not a worsening GI bleed, maybe they perforated, right? So looking through, we can see there's a very subtle positive fast. Then we come on this side. We can see there's a little bit more. Yeah, right. This one, not so subtle. And we come down to the bladder, right? More positive fast. And then we look at our heart. Her squeeze is good. There's no pericardial effusion. And her IBC is kissing. <clears throat> so all of this is going to go to some sort of like hemorrhagic shock appearance, right? We're hypotensive, our volume's down. So our IBC, our CVP pressure is really low. And we've got free fluid in our belly. We look at her lungs. She's got good lung sliding on both sides. And so we got her CAT scan, right? And so she's got a ruptured, uh, yeah. So lots of free fluid and air in her belly from her perfed peptic ulcer disease. So a nice little kind of example of how it'll help. Um, if you guys can bear with me for like five more minutes, we're going to just do a quick image review. Some stuff you guys haven't seen. So this is just kind of a preempt of what you're going to learn. And I'm going to walk you through 
some of these quick little interpretations. So this is a DVT study. We're up by the mid thigh. So for a DVT study, you want to compress the vein enough so that it should completely collapse and disappear and the artery should only start to slightly deform. So this is your vein right here. I'm pushing down and it completely collapses. So there's no DVT. Some people will see this structure and they'll think there's a clot up here, but this is a lymph node. And when you sort of slide or fan through, you'll notice that there's a distinct start and stop to the structure and that it is um, very small. And so if it was a vein or clot in a vein, right, it's going to be a tubular structure and it should continue the whole way above and below. So don't get faked out by lymph nodes. This is an example of a positive DVT. So here's my vein. You can see I'm pushing hard enough that this vein right here collapses and my artery is getting deformed, but this is not. So this is a positive DVT. Here's a nice example of two pathologies. So again, you can find your pericardium. There's fluid between the myocardium and pericardium here. And then if your eyes kind of track over here, we also see that there's fluid. And this bright white is actually lung. So we're in a sub xiphoid view. Here's my right ventricle. There's my left ventricle. This is actually my aorta right here. There's my right atrium. You can see a little bit of free fluid right there. So then my pericardium. And then this is a right pleural effusion. So you can tell it's right because we're looking at the liver from on the right side of the body. So this is a parasternal short echo view. So this is your left ventricle. This is your right ventricle. You can notice that there is a small amount of free fluid, a pericardial effusion kind of tracking down here. And then if you notice, right, the EF is absolutely terrible. And if you look at the squeeze, this, the posterior wall and inferior wall and lateral wall are all squeezing, but the septum, there's absolutely no contraction, right? There's akinesis. So not only is the EF really low, but there's regional wall motion abnormality. This is a fancy one. This is an apical four chamber. So here's your left ventricle, left atrium, right atrium, and then we're getting aorta. Again, flow coming towards the probe is going to be red. So here's my aorta. And every time my heart goes into um, diastole, right, there is flow going from the aortic valve into my ventricle. So therefore, this person has aortic regurgitation, right? Because that blood should not be coming from the aorta back into the ventricle. And then if you look at the mitral valve, every time the mitral valve closes, so it goes into systole, there is a blue streak of blood going from the ventricle into the atria, right, away from the probe. So again, this is mitral regurg. So they've got aortic regurg and mitral regurg. And if you look at their EF, it's really terrible. So this is a very sick heart, right? This is not somebody you want to give a lot of fluids to because they have like zero forward flow. This is a parasternal long video. So again, like we said, sub xiphoid and parasternal long, right ventricle is always on the top. Here's your left ventricle, left atrium, aorta, aortic valve. Lots of stuff in this one. If you notice right here, there's some hypoechoic fluid filled structure, right? But if this was a pleural, if this was a pericardial effusion and it's this large, it should track all the way across, right? It doesn't really make sense that it's this deep, like it's it gets cut off my screen, but it's only located on one side. And we use, when we talk about echo, we're gonna talk a lot about the descending thoracic. So this is the um, sort of, depth marker, and it's a nice way to figure out if something you're looking at is intra-pericardial sac or if it's extra-pericardial, right? So because you only see the fluid on one side of the descending thoracic, this is a pleural effusion, and it's because it's towards the left side, right? There's the left apex of the heart, towards the apex of the heart, so this is a left pleural effusion. The other thing you notice, we talk about the right ventricle should never be bigger than the left. And here you can see the right ventricle is huge. The septum is also bowing into, this is the same heart and short axis. Here's my left ventricle. The septum is bowing 
into my left heart. And if you go back to the heart that wasn't working very well, even this one with the akinetic septum, right, was still round and going into the right ventricle. So this is nice and normal. This tells me that the pressure on the left side is higher than the pressure in the right. Once the septum starts bowing into the left ventricle, the pressure on the right side of the heart is now higher than the left, and that's totally pathologic. So this is either well, vo hugely volume overloaded, this is pulmonary hypertension, this is PE. This is a bad right heart. Don't give this person more fluids, right? It's just going to cause more of an outflow obstruction. This is a little hard to tell. This is the same view of this patient, just kind of zoomed in. So this is where like not enough depth kind of makes it hard to figure out what it is you're looking at. I feel like I'm looking at Dumbo waving his trunk at me, <laughs> right? But once I zoom out, I'm like, ah, I totally understand, right? So now here's my diaphragm. Here's my liver. There's my kidney. I don't see any free fluid here. Definitely free fluid here, right? And there's my positive spine sign. This little white thing is atelectatic lung, sort of floating in this large effusion. And even though this is a bit overgained, uh, you can notice there's these little speckly things floating in here. So this is a plankton sign. So this could be either from uh, an exudative effusion. So it's either pneumonia or it could be malignancy, probably malignancy given the size. Here we kind of saw already. So this is lung. There's my rib. Here's my rib. There's my pleural line. And then now we see my pleura is sort of jagged, broken, and there's these focal uh, vertical ring down artifacts, aka B lines, coming from here. So this is pneumonia. This is also pneumonia. So this one, we talk about pneumonia in the lungs, there's sort of a spectrum. So mild kind of looks like this. As you start to get more severe, this little consolidation will start to grow larger and larger and larger. And you will start to get what's called hepatization, where you get this consolidated lobar pneumonia. And essentially, your lung starts to look like your liver. If you notice right here, how this looks like liver. And this is socked in giant lobar pneumonia. And I know this is not mirror artifact because my spine is now above my diaphragm, right? Here's my diaphragm. I can see my trace pleural effusion. And here's my socked in lobar pneumonia. And there's my spine above hand. So it's a little bit tricky, but once you slow it down, and then again, you can see there's effusion, there's B lines, there's atelectatic lung in there. And then you can get that little bit of hepatization. So this is a sick pneumonia. This is a, a bad patient. A couple more images. We're almost done. Thanks for coming to the home stretch. Again, um, some fast exam. This is our left upper quadrant. We're looking above the diaphragm. I don't really see anything. I don't see a great view above it. That's okay. I'm tracking. I don't see below it very well either. I'm tracking in between. I don't see any free fluid. I'm tracking that inferior tip of the spleen and tracking above. And I don't see anything there. There's a little cyst right there, if you notice, but that's not free fluid. Again, it's round, it looks enclosed, encapsulated. And then look at the kidney. My pelvis is nice and decompressed, and I've got nice sharp margins. So I don't see any renal pathology. So this is a nice normal. This one is also left upper quadrant, kind of similar to the one that we used to trick you out. Here, you're getting a little snippet of the spleen. And you can, your eyes will start to get kind of trained at looking at the echo textures. So I can look at this and I know that spleen just because it looks more solidy as opposed to like bowel gas. The kidney is kind of hidden over here, which we don't see very well. There's a rib shadow right in our way, so we didn't quite twist enough. There's my diaphragm. I don't really know what's going on above the diaphragm. I think it's a mirror just because I don't see the spine extending upward. And then there's this weird thing. So I know it's deep to my spleen. So again, if I'm imaging very posterior and my beam is aimed up towards the ceiling, I'm going to be cutting through the spleen and imaging the stomach. And again, that's sort of fluid filled. I see the little bright white speckles in there. So this is stomach. There is, however, free fluid here. And if you look up here, you can see 
kind of right here, there's a little bit of free fluid. And then let me see, you can really appreciate it right here. So again, that tip of the spleen and tracking above the spleen. Here's a nice example of cellulitis. Again, so you have that sort of loss of that normal architecture where you get this kind of homogenous gray appearance to the soft tissue. It actually will get thicker. And then you're going to start to get what we call cobblestoning. So it looks like cobblestones on like a road where you see fluid and edema kind of um, sneaking in and out and in between these little fat lobules. Here is a left upper quadrant, sorry, right upper quadrant view. We get, we don't really see above below diaphragm very well. I think maybe that's diaphragm, I'm not really super sure. Here, I don't see any free fluid between liver and kidney, nothing at the inferior tip of the liver, nothing at the inferior tip of the kidney. I look at the outline of the kidney, which looks normal. I look at the kidney now, and now I have sort of distension all the way throughout. So I can see this is moderate hydronephrosis, and they're all sort of interconnected with each other. This one you guys saw already, right? So there's a little bit of free fluid tracking around that kidney. You've got hydronephrosis and hydroureter. And then the coolest one of all, so you can put color flow on the bladder and you can actually assess for urine going into the bladder to see if the ureter is patent or if it's obstructed. The other thing that happens is when you put color flow on a stone, it makes the sound beam has some energy and so it makes the stone vibrate a little bit and so it makes it move. And when it moves, the machine sees that as motion and it creates this thing called a twinkle artifact where it's a little stone that's sort of twinkling in it. So this person has a UVJ stone and you can see that it's right there. And I can tell you that that ureter up here is patent. So if you're assessing somebody who's say with flank pain and you scan them, they've got hydro on one side, you go and you do their bladder, you put your bladder jet on and you find a twinkle artifact right at the UVJ you sort of made their diagnosis and you don't necessarily need the CAT scan. And you can manage them conservatively, fluids, pain medicine, and then follow up. I think this is the last one. Thank you guys for bearing with me. The rest of these lectures will not be this long. Um, there, this is just kidney, still image. And then just kind of a reminder, you can see that bright white extending all the way up into the pyramids. So this is your nephrocalcinosis, your um, medullary sponge kidney. Oh, just kidding, I have one more. Mm -hmm. So this one's a tricky one. So gallbladder, we can see there's an obvious stone right there, but the stones that are kind of hanging out over here aren't usually the ones causing the problem, right? Because the gallbladder's not contracting against them. They're just kind of there for the ride. It's the stones that like to hide right here. And you can see that there's a little bit of shadowing that hang out in the gallbladder neck. And those are the ones that cause your problems. And those are the ones that are gonna give you the cholecystitis and the, the biliary colics. So don't get tricked by that one. That tells you there's a stone. You might not have seen that one. Maybe this is enough to say, oh, it's probably biliary colic that's doing it. But just make sure you're looking at that neck too. All right, cool. That's all I got. I'm gonna stop presenting. Um, Anybody have questions? Nope, thank you. All right, cool. Thanks. This is recorded. It will post to the FAST lecture under Teams. The June schedule is in for the Doodle poll, so just make sure that you pick your dates. And then I will blast email with the link for the Lung lecture, which will be in June. And then, all right, cool. Have a good one. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Stop the recording. Oh.